And as I start with his bio, I would like to invite Alex Lazarevich with Stanley Black and Decker to join us here on a virtual stage. Stage. So Alex, thank you so much. Just a little bit about you before I hand the mic over. Um, Alex leads the company's efforts to drive savings through advanced big data analytics and is responsible for providing a scalable enterprise-wide data lake warehouse platform, as well as leveraging machine learning, AI tools to solve various business problems, including supply chain, optimization, pricing, e-commerce, sales and marketing, and customer experience. So Alex is going to be talking to us today about the CDO as a catalyst for a data-driven culture. So please join me in welcoming Alex to our virtual stage. Alex, I'll have you take it away. Thank you, Shaleen. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Let me know if everything looks fine. I see it, Alex. Just if you could put it in presentation mode. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Okay, everything looks good? It does. It looks okay. great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, data-driven culture is pretty popular topic these days. You probably heard it multiple times and you probably realize in a role of chief data officer or maybe chief analytics officer, in order for you to really be successful, you really need to enable your organization to be to create the value. I think that's the most important thing that you'll be valued against. So data-driven culture is such a buzzword and there is so much noise about big data analytics in general. Many people actually do not fully comprehend what it really means. And today I'm gonna cover some of these things, what really data-driven data culture means, what it takes to build it, why it's so hard, and why so many companies are still struggling there. So let's start with the question, what is a culture? So basically, uh, you can see here the Merriam-Webster dictionary that defines culture as a customary beliefs, social forms and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. Is it a right colorful clothing for some nations? Or is it particular dance? Or is it basically all of these things, all the people around the world? And whatever the culture you belong, there are certain norms you, we need to follow. And the uh, culture typically encompasses things that are invisible to the naked eye at the first glance, but at least take into account some values and beliefs that people hold and how these beliefs are manifested in their behavior in their everyday lives. So next step when I want to discuss today is really about the corporate culture. Corporate culture really defines how decisions are made throughout the company and within the organization. You probably heard multiple times the quote from Harvard Business Review from 2018 that culture eats strategy for breakfast. I never heard something opposite. And indeed, if you are in the meeting with a group of executives and you're discussing about potentially company strategy or any kind of plan, many executives are preparing their strategy decks. That's something you will expect to have. But when you start a meeting, it's really the corporate culture within your organization will define which ideas are heard, which ideas will be the best received, and which ideas will be really implemented at the end. So if you do not fit into that corporate culture, you may never be successful in that environment, regardless how great you are otherwise. So basically, that's where we come to data-driven culture. What is really a data-driven culture? According to McKinsey Institute, data culture is decision culture. It basically defines how decisions are made throughout the company. So basically, as you can see here, there are multiple benefits, really, oops, sorry. There are multiple benefits of having a data-driven culture that includes like to have improved efficiency and effectiveness, create more opportunities to grow or even reduce the cost. So right now in organization, you may have like consensus uh, culture when everybody tries to agree, uh, basically when everyone tries to agree before certain decisions are made or actually you have a kind of the boss structure when everyone listens to your boss, which is hierarchical structure. But regardless what kind of the data driven, what kind of the culture you have, data driven culture is trying to actually provide a trade off between these two extremes. In data driven culture, really this is a compromise between uh, all and actually the information effects 
are really valued. And all decisions at the end should be made based on dot, that data. And you should be able most often to make right decisions, but not because of the consensus or not because of the boss is always right approach, but because of supporting data, the data that is supporting every decision. So in order to achieve this data-driven culture, depending on the company that you're located, this is extremely, extremely difficult. It's not easy at all. So right now, when we have a basic understanding of what data-driven culture really is, many organizations also realize the value of data-driven decision-making. And they also feel the pressure from the competitors and also feel the pressure by Wall Street and shareholders to invest in these kind of technologies. Uh, however, it's not easy. There is a lot of noise in this space and many companies really try to actually hire a few experienced data scientists from big tech, comp uh, big tech companies because that's usually what they uh, do and they have experience in this. However, what they don't realize is that these people that they come from the big tech companies like Google, Amazon, these companies already build the data-driven culture within those companies. And there's when these data scientists come to your organization, they are typically frustrated with slow and manual business processes, lack of data, poor data quality, and generally lack of understanding what data science and what the data analytics is. So as you can see here in this graph by McKinsey, Many companies are trying to reap the value. If you have these early adopters, which is uh, kind of see online, you can see the companies that invest initially. This is kind of how much money you're investing in particular initiative. These companies will invest in this kind of technologies early, early, but they would reap tremendous value over the period of the next 10 years. You have quick followers who are actually slowly investing and then doing some kind of uh, relatively slower uh, response, what, how much value they create. And finally, you have laggards, companies that do not invest in these technologies, they will simply disappear. So having a data-driven culture, applying data analytics is not really nice to have. It's a must capability for every organization. So I know that we don't have uh, access to the chat, but I typically like to ask the audience to estimate how, what's the percentage of data science project that fail right now? And I know that I don't have access, but some people will be surprised that more than 80% of analytics projects fail. And one of the main reasons why these projects fail is actually lack of proper understanding of analytics or big data, and also lack of engagement and commitment on the business side. Because if you don't understand something that you want to do, that project will typically fail. And the Gartner uh, Chief Data Officer study actually confirmed the same thing. You can see here that these are the most critical factors in uh, building a uh, data, successful data analytics organization. And you can see that data-driven culture is by far the most important factor. And this is uh, this survey done by, I believe, around 300 CDOs across North America. And by far, all these people believe that data-driven culture is the most important factor in building successful in analytics organization and creating the value around the company. <clears throat> So the second thing is advanced uh, analytical capabilities that focus mostly on the technical and technology aspects. But you can see that 36% is by far the biggest factor why uh, these companies succeed. Okay, so let's see what are the main barriers and main challenges in order to build successful data-driven culture. And I will start with people. I believe there are five types of people that are actually the main reasons why uh, data-driven culture cannot be easily made. The first one is, I would call, dogmatic and arrogant statistician. This is person who have typically a PhD in statistics. They are smart enough to build the models. They love to build, manually build, linear regression model, logistic regression model. They enjoy ANOVA analysis, things that were popular maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. He loves actually also to understand the, the data, dig deep into data, and actually everything else in these models is black box to them. So the second kind of barrier, in my opinion, the second type of group are actually sexy and overconfident data scientists. You probably heard multiple times that uh, Harvard Business Review announced data scientists as the sexiest job of 21st century, 
And you have a, we have a long, young millennial here who actually just got their master degree in analytics and they believe they can find a job and they can create an impact. And this is the people who typically like to build the models. They don't care about the business impact. Uh, basically, uh, they try to build all fancy models like deep learning, random forest, the gradient boosting it is sent. And actually they typically don't care about anything else. And uh, they, for example, have problem to connect to the business and understand what really business problem is. These people typically try to attempt to get 100% increase in salary without actually contributing much to the value of the organization. The third group is compliance and regulation officer. And these people typically like to stay in charge by always saying no. He does not even remember what real compliance rules are, and but he likes to stay in charge by actually refusing all requests, either for the data or the data to be shared across the organization. And he typically likes to handle with uh, statisticians because they are best friends. They live in the time which was like 20 or 30 years ago. The next uh, group is a territorial IT guy. How many times? Some of you went to IT with requests to either install some infrastructure, install GPU, install some software, and you got a lot of hesitation, a lot of uh, basically requests for particular funding, and all of these things are really slowing down. They will attempt to get you fired, even physically attacked, if you try to install anything without their permission. Uh, they believe they own their own servers and they really don't contribute to the overall uh, data-driven culture of trying to actually share the data across the whole company. And finally, uh, you have an intuitive businessman. These are people who typically do not trust any data, any data analytics at all. They trust their gut feeling and they believe uh, actually that everything they learn is so useful for everything that will happen in the future. They typically don't believe in any predictive models and they have a problem adjusting to new trends and actually they may have a difficulty to survive in this kind of new environment. So these are kind of the main, in my opinion, main factors really, why sometimes building successful data-driven culture is not an option. So let's dig a little bit deeper. The question is how we can really change uh, culture? And from what I said earlier, we can really see that uh, if you want to try the change the culture, we have to start with the people. And we need to understand what really influences human behavior. What we, ba we basically figure out that we need to change the human behavior, but really what, what are the major factors behind actually changing some of this human behavior? Is it, are, are these some kind of incentives? It is some training education that you can provide to people to learn about new technology and actually educate themselves. Is it just natural curiosity? Because some people like to learn by themselves without actually being uh, pressed by the peers or by uh, supervisors, or is it just the technology? What is actually causing human behavior to change? And in order to understand this, we can see actually, we need to understand why people do certain things. We are trying to understand basically why, like, what are the different assumptions that make basically to force what people do? And let's see if the people are trying to always do the right thing. Probably not. Uh, just look at some headlines recently, the newspapers across the uh, internet. You will figure out that people definitely don't do the right thing all the time. Do people do what they want to do? That would be ideal or what they need to do. That would be really ideal, but sometimes they don't do that either. Sometimes how many times you wanted to write a book about something or you wanted to do something that will improve you or and do you always do what you need to do? For example, are you planning to do cleaning of your garage? Because that's something that is going you know, to play it for like a year or maybe to do the lawn mowing. These are some things that we need to do. We know we need to do, but we don't take a pleasure in those. So at the end, we basically figure out that people typically do what is easy. And uh, instead of doing all things before, what is right, what they want to do, people they tend to do what is easy. That's the reason we watch sit in the couch and watch TV. We spend time on Instagram, Twitter. We play some stupid games on Xbox or our phones because human beings fundamentally 
do what is easy. They don't like to do some extra thing. And of course, there is always a factor they are uh, reluctant to any kind of change. So how technology can help in this kind of changing behavior? So in my opinion, good technology make it easier for people to do all these things that we mentioned earlier. So good technology can help people do the right thing. For example, here you have all these kind of uh, agricultural robots that help people plant the seed, pick up the fruit or vegetables. And if this is the right thing, this is actually you're helping the humankind to survive and makes easier. So if you combine technology that you make to do right things easier, then you will be succeeding. Also, you have the example of the lawn mowing robot here that you're basically taking like a few hours on your time and does the job for you. <clears throat> so this is how we can try to leverage technology. Let's go back to the data-driven culture and try to understand why people do not use data when they are making decisions. So one assumption is we have these arrogant businessmen or intuitive businessmen that do not believe in data at all. Sometimes they're arrogant, sometimes they are not. <clears throat> and that could be true. Some people are like that. Some, another reason maybe that people are afraid of any change that could come with analytics, that could come with data, and they could be proven wrong that actually whatever they were thinking with their gut feeling or tribal knowledge is not correct anymore. <clears throat> However, although some of these are partially true, I think the main reasons or the most uh, reasonable reasons why people do not use data in making data-driven decisions are the following three things. The first thing, they're getting the data is extremely hard and takes too long. How many times some of you actually wanted to do something with respect to data analytics and you waited for data much longer than you could anticipate? And this could be for many different reasons, really. Either you have too many legacy systems, either you have lack of subject matter access across the organization, or you have some uh, infrastructure issues. The reasons why you're not getting data immediately uh, limitless, really. The second reason is the data quality. Typically, the data quality within our organization is not great. And the data is typically not easy to comprehend or understand. And using our previous analogy, uh, how many times when you get the data, you realize that the data is of horrible quality? There are multiple issues with this, there are duplicates, there are missing values, and there is no proper explanation also what the tables and fails in that. In generally, it's really hard to understand what is there and how you will analyze. And finally, you have a fear. People generally fear uh, misinterpreting the data and because they don't want to make wrong decisions. Because of these previous two factors, getting data is too hard and the data quality is poor, they really fear they don't want to make any decision based on wrong data. And also there are no easy tools that will help them to actually analyze this data at all. So let's see how we can fix some of these problems. So every of these aspects could be addressed by one of these uh, green things that we see here. So the first thing that you really have to enable is providing this data search and discovery capability. What I mean by this, that you will be able to find relevant data quickly and without any challenges, really. So, in order to do this, you will have to have data dictionaries, easy way to actually find uh, data sources, to find data APIs, to find different file systems, where data is located, what are the subject matter experts you need to pull in order to get some of these data. Sometimes some of these data is already existing within your central repository or central data lake. Regardless, uh, it depends really what kind of the structure you have within your organization right now. So this is what you're trying to do first. The second thing regarding the data quality, you probably know already that there are many uh, vendors that are providing the solution around master data management and data governance. Uh, you really need to establish the trust that people have in data. You have a saying in, in dollar we trust, here we need a saying in data we trust. So basically the data, we need to make sure the data is accurate and appropriate to use from the perspective we are trying to use in the context we are trying to use. And we need to make sure that this uh, data is appropriate, not only from the legal and compliance perspective, because that could be really great issue, especially for healthcare industry, but also from the perspective of actually accuracy of the data, the data actually is accurate and you are 
sure that whatever you want to do will make sense. So these two kind of uh, categories here, data search and discovery and data management and data governance are easily accomplished through technology. You have uh, several vendors that provide capability in this space like uh, Alation and Colibra, and these are just some of them, but are probably most prevalent in the industry. And, but you also need to have kind of data catalog, enterprise data catalog across the whole organization. So that's basically where data literacy comes. In data literacy, you're really trying to, uh, basically this is related to education and the training of people. And it really relates to when someone says, then when you see the data, you have to understand it and you have to interpret it correctly. So all these kind of three pieces define the data culture. In my opinion, data, search and discovery, data management and data governance is more related to technology, how we can support this and how we can, what kind of technology and vendors and tools we need to provide to the people across the organization. While data literacy is really more defined around education and training, what kind of things we need to do uh, as chief data officer or chief analytics officer. I believe there was a panel earlier today around data literacy and there were some great comments there. In my opinion, I would try to focus a little bit in this space and try to basically share how we can uh, go and build uh, better data literacy to, today. According to Gartner, data literacy is defined the ability to read, write, and communicate data in the context with understanding of data sources and constructs, analytical methods, and techniques applied, and the ability to describe the use case application and resulting business value outcome. So as you can see here, in traditional world, you have people, processes, and technologies. They interact between themselves. You have these kind of cross-functional teams. If you want to really build data-driven culture, you really need to make sure that data sits between all of these people. And when people talk, they commonly use data to make data decisions. So informally, you can say, do you speak data? Which means, do you understand what data your business uses? Do you understand what that means? Do you trust your data? And can you make reasonable business decisions by analyzing this data? So let's understand what are the kind of few major steps that we can take as an organization to build data literate organization or improve the data literacy in general. So one of the first thing that you need to do is to drive the awareness of big data, of analytics or data science. And actually you need to dedicate one person who would serve in that role. Basically someone who is a data culture evangelist or AI evangelist, person who will spread the idea or actually uh, spread the analytics awareness and education about analytics in general. Second thing is to try to develop enterprise wide vision for data literacy. What it really means, what it means for different organization. Depending on the company you're in, you may have a different silos and developing this enterprise-wide vision for data literacy may be really hard, but you really need to figure out what data literacy means for different parts of your organization. In the third step, you need to try to assess and examine or evaluate actually the current status, how much people understand analytics. For example, right now we are partnering with the Pluralsight and we are trying to go to the series of assessments, how much people understand analytics which path they want to take in the future and what, what are the gaps they need to cover. I think this is really important part. Without people properly understand the capabilities of big data or analytics or AI and machine learning, we would not go far. Next step, after this kind of series of assessments are done, you really need to devise this data literacy learning a curriculum. What people really need to do, what are their gaps, what are their aspirations, and make the right career path for them. And finally, when you're done with all this, you have to launch and try to execute or implement your data literacy program. You want to basically try to reward people who drive value from data, who express natural curiosity by looking at data, using the different tools. You also want to build some kind of internal competitions. You try to actually make sure you have to do proper advertising of the things you're doing. Uh, trying to speak at external events like what I'm doing right now, and just to fuel that interest in people around the data. There is so much hype right now. 
people still do not understand a lot of things. And by providing the proper seminars, proper education, these are just different ways how you can uh, fuel some of this interest and build the data literacy across the whole organization. So when you talk about the organization, there are several ways how you can do that. What works, what worked for us is really, we are trying to actually structure the whole organization around several uh, teams. We typically try to have a product management team that serves like a bridge between the technical team and the IT team and the business partners trying to basically understand and do like a data storytelling or data translation in some words. You really need to have a data platform that you provide all these tools that we mentioned like infrastructure, you need to provide data governance, data management, but also easy data search and discovery. You have to have, of course, data analytic, data science team that will be working closely with all these teams to actually unlock insights, trying to understand what are the business problem and convert those business problem into a little solution that will at the end create the value for the whole organization. Uh, finally, you have the value acceleration team that is really important. They are trying really to make sure that for every analytical solution that you build as a team, there is a proper adoption plan. There is a proper <clears throat> tracking of the value that you're creating, quantifying the value and making sure that actually business inherits this over a while. And that's actually the goal of building the whole data-driven organization. <clears throat> when you start from the small data science team, when you can see here, you basically typically focus on smaller things. Typically, the best way to engage with the business is through different kind of dashboards and reporting visualization tools that will really gain their interest and curiosity. The second thing you're trying to build like a center of excellence when you're trying to actually take more use cases, more strategic use cases, when you're trying to address some of the issues that we talked earlier, and you're trying really to go into the analytics hub and spoke organization. And that is basically when you try to overgrow your centralized analytics organization, when you are at the stage when you, when you create a data-driven culture that many business partners understand what analytics is, what data science is, you're really trying to actually distribute some of parts of your team into the business because they will fit much better. They already have a culture they will foster because if data scientists do not feel they are part of that overall data-driven culture, they will not be happy. And your projects, your strategy, analytics strategy may not succeed. So finally, <clears throat> Many organizations are asking themselves, which kind of hierarchical organization is better for us? Cent centralized organization when we have all data scientists in a single place or federated when you have data, data teams sitting in different organizations? The answer is really that depends on your company. If you are early in the journey of building a data-driven culture, you're better off using a centralized center of excellence on late organization. If you're further in the journey of building data-driven culture, like Google, Amazon, you're really better off having all these analytics teams sitting within the business. And you can often see this in a company like Facebook, Amazon, you have multiple analytics teams that are focusing on multiple initiatives. So I would definitely end here. I would like audience to provide any answers. This is my email. I would like to thank you for your time. It's hard to actually talk when you don't see the audience, but I hope I did my best. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. No, no, you did great. You did great. Um, and, and it's wonderful that we are able to, to meet virtually for now and still be able to share the thought leadership. So I, I appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise today. I'm just looking at the clock to make sure we have a couple of minutes. And uh, I wanted to throw a couple of questions your way, Alex. And I think that last slide may have addressed it a little bit. Um, but the first question is how long does it typically take to build a data-driven culture within a company? And I, I kind of see some of the years listed yeah. there, so you could expand on that. Yeah, I think this typically, I think this uh, reflects a little bit our journey, our company, but as I said, every company is, is uh, has a different journey, different culture. And depending on your current status of where you are on that journey of data-driven culture, it, it may take, uh, more or less time for you. So if you start really from the scratch, you don't have any data science team, it will take probably at least four or five years to start building that data-driven culture, especially if you are a big organization that you have to move across different silos and everything. The size also is very important. The big organization moves slower. If you have a small organization, it's definitely easier to build that. 
but this is typically for companies who have more than 10,000 employees. <laughs> No, I mean, that, 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 does, that definitely makes sense. And, and that might um, lead into our next question, which is who are the major stakeholders you need to be working with? There are multiple really major stakeholders. You definitely need to get exact, I mean, buy-in from the CEO uh, to uh, develop this kind of strategy because uh, typically CEO finally realize there is absolutely must to have big data, analytics across their companies. You typically will get this. So major stakeholders around this will include IT, will include all the business partners that you are working with, even uh, executive committee for, for your whole company, even maybe the board of directors. These are all executive sponsors that you need to work with in order to make sure that everything works fine. And of course, you need to have really proper technical support from IT in order to provide the right infrastructure and the right tools to build that kind of data literacy and data culture in general. So actually I was going to ask how, when you mentioned data literacy, how can we evaluate data literacy within our organizations? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> so what we are doing right now, I mentioned earlier that we are trying to partner with a vendor that provides a training. They provide a series of assessments and depending on, uh, roles. We also try to define several roles that are present in analytics world, let's put it that way. So there are roles that are not just technical, but roles that are focusing on our product management, project management, uh, scrum master activities, people who are focusing on visualization or deployment of analytical solution. So we really try to uh, define the roles first. We try to uh, create the right assessments for these roles. Based on these assessments, we will basically try to evaluate the gaps in these employees based on their aspirations and preferences. And based on those gaps, we are trying to actually build the plan for each of them. And this is one way how you can evaluate that kind of data-driven culture, data literacy across the whole organization. Mm -hmm. um, and Alex, I just received uh, an audience question, um, which is what, what are the key, what key priority what is the key priorities to set as a new CDO? New, uh, I believe the key priority is really to set the right education and training and increase the awareness of data analytics. I think I, I, was, at a, uh, I was at a Gartner data conference last week and uh, one of the keynotes mentioned that basically data science or data analytics is not about technology. It's more like behavioral science. And this confirms what I said earlier that 80% of analytics projects typically fail because of the lack of understanding, lack of engagement, lack of commitment from the business side. And I believe this is absolutely number one priority to make sure that the people who you're working uh, or you're trying to use uh, analytics, they properly understand what analytics is, they have the right uh, expectations, what could be accomplished through analytics. I think this is really number one priority in my opinion. Well, and, and I think that leads into another question that popped into my head and that is, what, and this might be a trick question, what, you know, what does good and bad data literacy look like? Ah, okay. <laughs> I think I, I had a slide on this in the backup, but I didn't include this. So basically, uh, the examples of the good data literacy really would mean that you have, <clears throat> Um, really define uh, data dictionaries. You really have defined tools for people to access the data in an easy fashion. You will have uh, data dictionaries that will provide easy understanding. Uh, and the bad data literacy would mean that you are talking about these things without actually doing anything. You can talk about data literacy is important, but at the same time, you continue to do kind of the old fashioned gut feeling tribal knowledge approach when you actually do not rely on data too much and you don't try to actually automate any of these processes. Yep, yep. Thank you so much for, for adding a little bit more to that explanation. And I think that we're close to time, Alex. Yep. You don't see any more audience questions, but I wanna thank you again for your time today and for sure, um, you know, thank you for your time. And I wish you well and a great rest of your day. I'm gonna get ready for our next 
keynote presentation that's coming up. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure to be here.